Good morning. Josh tells me it's after 11 and I have to stop talking and start church now. <clears throat> Welcome guys. You guys are brave in the chilliness this morning. Hopefully this is the worst it'll get because we're at the end of January. Hopefully from here on out it just starts. Bev says no. You don't think so? Let's see. Hopefully it doesn't get any colder than this. But thank you guys so much for being here. Um, hopefully we can warm up in the sun and, and worship together. Um, just want to welcome you guys this morning. Uh, for those of you joining us online, thanks for joining us there. My name is Leah. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, happy birthday, Holly Springs Vineyard. We are six years old this week. Did you know? So unfortunately, as a, everything else with COVID, it's killed our party. Um, normally we'd have a big food celebration and stuff and we can't do that. But I was just kind of reflecting this morning. We had our our first service in Sunshine Gymnastics shoved in the little birthday party rooms six years ago. And it was great. And there was chalk everywhere. And it smelled like sweaty little girl feet. And it was wonderful. But I was just, you know, kind of reminiscing this morning about all the different places and, and the ways that the Lord has been good to us and all the, the businesses in this town that have been so kind to us and let us meet there. And we've done everything from spring loaded bouncy floors to really, really fancy 1840s mansions where I was terrified a kid was going to break a 200 year old window with frozen pipes. With frozen pipes. <laughs> we couldn't, that's right. We couldn't use the bathrooms because the pipes froze over one time. Um, it was, it was so cold. As a matter of fact, I think it was as cold in there. It was, cold. it was colder in there than it was out here right now. It was extremely cold. We could see our breath. Um, yeah, we, we've done a lot. It's been fun. Um, we're grateful for this space. We're grateful that we can meet outside together. Um, so thank you for being here. And hopefully, maybe we'll get to have a delayed birthday party or something this year. Um, I miss doing the pictures, so maybe I'll have to throw something up on the Facebook page this week of our, there's <laughs> on all of the pictures this year, the ones that I have of the stuff we were actually able to do, everybody's wearing a mask. Um, so it's not, not quite as fun as normal, but we've got some good ones. Um, I wanted to tell you guys about something that happened yesterday. I think some of you kind of saw my last minute post on Slack about the outreach that a group of us did in both Fuquay and over here, just right around the corner in Holly Springs. Um, we, we, it was the same kind of deal, same group of folks that did the turkey handout at Thanksgiving and then again at Christmas. And there's a, we just, just a little apartment complex, a government sub subsidized apartment complex over in Fuquay. And we just took some school supplies to some kids over there, some elementary school kids, sec second semester starting, started last week. And, uh, you know, they, a lot of those kids, they can't afford their own school supplies, even the things that they need to do stuff virtually, their notebooks and their pens and their pencils and things. And so the girls went with me and we went over there and handed some stuff out. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with people lately about having a difficult time hearing from the Lord lately. Um, not related to this, but just, you know, God, are you quiet? God, why aren't we hearing from you as much? God, why aren't we getting as many words of knowledge? Um, and I'm going to tell you something. Being over there and ministering to those um, in need who don't have the resources to make it on their own, especially right now. I got more words of knowledge for people yesterday than I have in years. The, the Lord speaking into people's lives, um, calling out things like loneliness and diabetes and just all sorts of different stuff where the Lord was saying, I see you to these people. And we spent time praying, you know, it was more, the school supplies are a way, to, it's a way to bless, but then we always minister as well and always offer to pray. And we had some really great prayer times, you know, lots of tears from people who felt, who felt very down and it was just a beautiful, beautiful day. And, um, I, so I want to tell you, you know, if, if you're one of those people who's feeling like, gosh, I'm having a hard time hearing from the Lord right now, I just want to encourage you to put yourself in a place of ministering to those in need. You know, God is close to the poor. And I know they say the, the poor, that's not like a real politically correct thing. But poverty is a very real thing, and we have it very close to us here, you know, in Holly Springs and in Fuquay and all around. And he, he rescues them, and he lifts them. So if you want to hear from the Lord, put yourself in a place of ministering to those who are absolutely desperate to hear the good news. Because he does, man. He speaks. And it, so it was amazing, amazing yesterday. 
getting these words and sharing them with these people and praying for them and blessing them. It, it was a wonderful time. So I tell you that because we're going to try and make this a monthly thing. Um, we're, we're coordinating, many of you know Melissa, um, that was that led our spoke at our women's retreat a couple years ago in the fall. Um, we've been doing a lot with her. She's preached here a couple of times. And we just, we, we just coordinate. It's not about a particular church thing. It's not about promoting a particular church. It's just about being the kingdom together and serving people and loving. And it was a really great time. So if you're not on Slack, please get on there. If you've shut all your notifications off, you may want to turn them back on. But we'll try to let you know on Sunday mornings too. This one was a little more last minute. Um, but yeah, it was a great time. So we'd love for more folks to join us and do this. We've got two particular neighborhoods that we want to focus on the, this year. Those same two, one in one in Fuqua and one in Holly Springs. And we're building some really neat relationships that I think are, are very kingdom advancing kind of things. So be praying for that and consider that. All right. Anything else? I think that was it. Can I tell you a funny story that has nothing to do with anything that I think that you guys know us might laugh about? Karis, I'm going to call you out. Sorry. So on the way home from doing this ministry yesterday, I thought this was so funny. You know, our, our poor pastor's kids, right? Like, they get drugged to everything. I, I drugged them to the ministry with me yesterday and made them freeze and carry heavy bags of school supplies around. They had a good time, though. I think they like serving serving other people. But on the way home, Karis and Ava were having this conversation about, you know, pastor's kid is like such a lame term. There's like nothing really exciting about that. Like, what what does that even mean? Like, I want a better term. So they've decided they're church princesses. So from now on, they are no longer pastor's kids. You may refer to them as the church princesses, apparently. I thought that was really cute. I laughed for a long time on the way home after that. Anyway, she's funny. Karis is funny. All right. Well, we're going to spend some time worshiping together this morning. Why don't Jessica and Paul and Jeremy up here are going to lead us. You good? So why don't we stand together and let's pray, invite the Holy Spirit, and then Josh will share the word and what he's gotten from the Lord for us afterward. Lord, I, I thank you again for six years. You are faithful. We've been through a lot, but it's never more than what you're prepared for. You are so faithful, Lord. You provide for us abundantly. You minister You've given us your spirit and your gifts and your words, and you have sustained us, Father. And I have full confidence this church is in your hands. And so, Lord, we ask that you come and do all that you please. We are your people. We are a people of your presence. We desire you to draw near. We want to hear from you. We want to see you, and we want to join with you in what you're doing. Thank you for the opportunity to do that this weekend, to bless those who don't have the resources that they need. Thank you for blessing us to be a blessing so that we can share what we have. And so, Lord, I pray that this would grow, this thing that was, has sort of just started organically, that it would grow, Lord. That we would build relationships with those around us who need us, who, who need us to share, who need the kingdom, who need the people of God to be the people of God, to have your values and live by them. So, Father, we worship you this morning. Holy Spirit, we ask you to draw near. We know you're here. May, would you make us aware of your presence? Help us to recognize where you are and what you're doing and what you're saying. Come, Lord Jesus. We love you and we are here for you in your name. Amen. Morning. My name is Jessica. I'm the worship leader here at the Vineyard Church of Holly Springs, and we are going to worship together for a bit. Um, lyrics are on our website, hollyspringsvineyard.org slash worship, or you can just click that worship tab. Uh, and we also might have some sound effects. Sorry. <laughs> Harmonies, they're off key. <laughs>
Father, you're here. I know you're not just here, but you are here. And so, Father, speak a blessing on the believers gathered wherever they are. In this town, in this state, in this country, around the world. Father, would your kingdom come? Would your will be done? Would you bless these words today? Would you have your way? In the name of Jesus. Amen. Ah, it's not as cold as I thought. It's, 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 we'll, we'll be okay. You know, one of my favorite bands did an, an interview a few years back, and, uh, and they were talking about one of the songs that I love to listen to. And they were questioned by this interviewer who knew musical theory as to why this certain harmony, one of the easiest harmonies, was actually missing, because they were really vocally accomplished. They're a band that was known for their, their vocal harmonies. And I'll, I'll never forget what they said. They said, that's the car harmony. And he, the interviewer said, well, what do you mean by that? We said, well, when we played this song, whenever we record this, we, we first did it singing in all the parts, but we really wanted the person who's listening to this in their car to feel like they had something that they could do. So we left that harmony just absent from it. And, and, and they felt like, as you hear this song, it's like, I could do that. I could fill in that gap. You know, and, and I think in our, in our church, we've been trying to do that ever since we, we started six years ago. You know, we, we've never seen this as a presentation style service. You know, we don't, we don't spoon feed things out and, and we're not expecting this to be the, the most perfect presentation. And, or, you know, we're not about all these programs and stuff. We're participatory. We really expected the engagement, not just of the people, but of the Holy Spirit, right? So that as we start doing things, we expect to see this happen. Um, and I think, and, and this is just a little bit of an aside before I get into my sermon, I think that my preaching style hasn't quite kept up with that. Uh, looking back at the, the sermons that I used to give from the first time I was ordained, they're thick. <laughs> they're, they're, they're dense, you know? It, it was like I was preparing a thesis or preparing for an argument, and I have research, and I have quotes, and, and I have all this background, and, and I have all this stuff because it's like I'm expecting an argument. Like I expect somebody to say, prove it. And so I've got all my research, I've got all of my ducks, you know, lined up, and I, I've got all this done. And so I'm going to be trying a new style of preaching. This could go very, very badly. This could be very, very awkward, and that's why I'm giving everybody here a, a heads up. Because I don't want to preach a, a research paper or an exhaustive concordance. That, that's not what I think my, my job is. You know, Jesus says that the kingdom of God is like a treasure in a field. You know, it's hidden. And I see it as like the, this treasure hunt. You know, I'm not going to be trying to argue. I'm not going to be trying to convince you with the words. I'm not trying to defend my own personal opinion in the matter. And the thing is, I, I have to be willing, and this is going to be one of the hard things, to be misunderstood and misrepresented. So with the, the things that I say, the way that I bring this about, I have to be willing to be misunderstood, misrepresented. Another hard part is if this goes well, you're going to think that you're the smart person in the room who came up with all the conclusions and my preaching is worthless, and I have to be okay with that. Because what I, I hope is, is that the words that we share, the way that we say this, it, it will bring about you to come before the Holy Spirit, and you will say, lead me, teach me. And that, that you complete that. There's a, there's a book that I, I've, that I read recently, and I used to have this idea that um, I'd only read authors who are dead and gone for about 100 years, because then you know that their works do the test of time, and it's something verifiable and good, and, and I like that. And so that was kind of my mantra on what I was taking, what I was reading, everything like that. And I read this guy who's still alive now, and his book is probably the most important book I've read in my entire life. I'm not even going to tell you what it is. But it's probably the most important book I've read in my entire life, and it, it shook me. And I came to this conclusion that, that a person writing now is able to speak to me now. They're able to, to, to be in communion with the Holy Spirit and what's going on in this, this culture, this day, this age, in a way that they didn't know about 100 years ago. Now, the important thing isn't the fact that I had this shift. The important thing is that I came to that conclusion myself, Right? It's something that, that I, if you told me that this was another way of looking at which books you choose, I wouldn't be convinced. But because I came to that conclusion myself, it was deeper. Do you know what I mean? 
I, I, I went along with it for that ride because I came to that conclusion myself. My hope is that as we open scripture, you will come to these conclusions yourself. You'll value them more because you know that they're yours. Does that make sense? So Leah shared last week, two weeks ago, two weeks ago yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I want to trust the Holy Spirit to accomplish what needs to be accomplished because it's about his words and not mine, his ability, not mine. When Leah shared last, it was about John the Baptist's disciple asking, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus pulled a typical Jesus move at that point, and he didn't answer their question directly. That's a yes or no question. <laughs> you know, they came to him with a yes or no question. Are you the one or should we look for another? And what does he say? Go report what you see. You know, what a frustrating answer. <laughs> like, I asked you a yes or no question. Can't you just give me a straight answer? And what he does is he invites them along, right? He invites them to discern, to look, to be a part of this. He, he doesn't satisfy that curiosity directly. He says, be a part of this yourself. Investigate, look, and find out. Because often we just want that exchange. I think we want that tweetable quote. We want that, that thing, that, that nugget we can walk away with. That's what that sermon was about. And we might be very disappointed from here on out. <laughs> So what if it's not heard, and what if it's the wrong conclusion? Jesus didn't seem to mind. He invited them along for the journey. He trusted the Holy Spirit. We have this game we did in our house when I was reading the Dr. Seuss books. I would read the first part of a rhyme and let the kids complete it. <laughs> you know, and, and after a while, they get really good at this because you know the flow of Dr. Seuss. It's a very repeatable pattern. And if, once you know that there's a fox introduced in the story, then every time that there's box, you can rhyme it with fox. It becomes very straightforward. So that's kind of the way that we're going to be doing this. We're going to be asking you a lot of questions and giving you a lot more time, not just to use reason and logic. The questions aren't rhetorical, all right? But they're not meant to be answered here and now. The best case scenario, I think, that are going to get you thinking, and throughout this week, um, you're going to be wrestling with it. And that's if I can't stop myself. I really hope this is the first week I'm trying this. I don't blurt out the answers. What I've done so far is the normal parts that I bold and highlight, I've gone ahead and I've deleted those parts and I've inserted questions. All right? That's the first strike that I'm going to take for this. We'll see how this goes. All right, now on to the sermon. <laughs> so the big idea in this series of living deliberately means that we're engaged in the moment, that we're being watchful and alert. And particularly in Scripture, there's times where Scripture says, behold or, or look or something similar, and that we're going to be doing just that. We look at those parts where he's calling our attention to something. Um, how many days this week do you remember? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Do you remember any of those days in particular or not? As a kid, there's two days that, that I remember for some reason deeply, deeply, deeply. There's two moments that I remember very deeply in, in my psyche. And the first one is that I was in a tree, and I was wearing my baseball uniform, and that's it. <laughs> But I remember thinking at that moment, I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life. And I do. <laughs> nothing particular going on. Nothing amazing happened. But I just made this decision to embed this moment in my memory. And I did. And then I remember years after that, we were living in Florida. We had a pool. There's like a state law. You have to have a pool if you live in Florida. I was, I was out by the pool, and I was looking down at this little, like, cobblestone-y kind of thing. That I think they call it the Chattahoochee kind of stone pressing that we had around our, our pool. And I remember thinking, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to remember this moment for the rest of my life. And I did it. <laughs> and those are strong memories. And I think that this is, is a part about living deliberately, Right? It's not that our lives are going to be so rich that we go from mountaintop to mountaintop. It's that we make intentional choices in our days to engage with the Holy Spirit, that we look for him, that we acknowledge that, that this moment matters. We acknowledge that his word, when he says, look and pay attention, that we look and pay attention. That's the, that's the whole heart behind this Living Deliberately series. The point isn't this amazing adventure that our, me our memory naturally engages, but to choose to be engaged with the Holy Spirit at any given moment. So this morning, Matthew 10, 16 through 17, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. 
I love the, the flow of that passage because we have behold and beware. <laughs> behold, but beware. This is from Matthew 10, but Matthew 9 is, is related too. We prayed it over uh, the, the braes last week as they leave to serve. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send workers. So we, we go from that idea of, of sending the, these workers out, praying the Lord of the harvest to this behold and beware. Quick note, uh, the NIV, if you've got that version, which a lot of us probably do, it doesn't have the word behold there in, be, in the beginning. And this is just kind of a, a nature of how this thing goes. In the Greek, there's this word edu. And the edu is just what comes before when it's emphasizing what's about to come. So it's, it's just exactly that. So the King James actually translate often low, you know, and we have behold in some of these. Uh, the NIV says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard, you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. Pay attention. So what's the treasure here? What are we to behold? What are we looking for? Why are we paying attention? We have a few hints. Sheep, wolves, snakes, and doves. And there's an emphatic statement. You will be handed over. It's the first question. Why be shrewd and innocent if we're going to be handed over? Why be shrewd and innocent if we're going to be handed over? So let's set the stage here. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits, to heal every disease and sickness. And these 12, in verse 5, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That's the setup. Then he tells you, behold and beware. He tells you the character that you're supposed to be going, but be careful. And where does it go from here? Verse 18, on my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to, to them, to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it is not you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents, have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. You are persecuted in one place, so flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Student is not above the teacher, nor servant above his master. It's not enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them. For there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What's whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Even the very hairs of your head will be numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. What a wonderful way to conclude that. You're worth more than many sparrows. You know, I think that a lot of us, whenever we, we start looking at, at our faith life, we start with the Roman road. What does the Roman road often tell us? Everybody sinned, <laughs> you know? And we start from this place of, of feeling like I'm in fear, like I screwed up, like I'm a, I'm a failure, and we, we feel like this shame, and like immediately. And that's our starting point for a lot of us, is, is this feeling behind the mark, feeling like we don't have enough, feeling like we don't measure up. And there's a real truth to that. But imagine, imagine our starting point instead is that you're worth more than many sparrows. Imagine your starting point is that you have eternal worth. And that's why those things are such a shame. If we, if we don't start off with the fact that our, our sin is what starts us off, if we start with the fact that you are of eternal worth, your beauty, your grace, the work that God has poured into you, the design he's put here, if that's our starting point, how wonderful. The rest of it actually makes a whole lot more sense. When we just preach the failure, when we just preach the disappointment, when we just preach that you're starting behind the mark, I think we're missing the true starting point. So sheep and wolves, we are purposely and knowingly sent as sheep among wolves. It's not an accident. 
It's not even unfortunate. It is consistent with the nature of wolves to attack sheep, right? That's what they do. That's their nature. It is not consistent with the nature that the sheep is going to go walk into the wolf's den. It's not consistent with the nature of a sheep. In contrast to what some preach, um, when you get saved today, all along Jesus has promised his disciples that their lives will have hardship, suffering, and perhaps even death. Also notable is that the sheep have no defense except running. <laughs> and they're not too good at that. The only thing that they really can do well is bleed out and call for a shepherd to come and help them. A defenseless sheep in the midst of a pack of wolves would stand no chance of survival without the protection of a courageous shepherd. It's that sense of, of helplessness, dependence that the Lord wants of us. You may remember that, that God gave Gideon the formidable challenge of liberating the Israelites from the, the mighty hand of, of the Midianites. And this is from, uh, from Judges. When he sent him with the words, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And Gideon responds by saying, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan's the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. It's the awareness of this complete inadequacy that, that enables him to be used so mightily by God. It's the aspiration of the sheep to be a wolf. Does the sheep think, if I'm really good, I can be like a wolf? To try to use it, its fangs and its claws and, and the way that, that the wolves do. Does the sheep look at that and say, I want to be just like that wolf when I grow up. If I was a really good sheep, that's how I want to be. I want to meet with that enemy on this battlefield. When you aspire to put on the armor of God, as it says, to stand, are you imagining that you're a wolf or a sheep? That verse in Ephesians says, if you don't remember, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. But there's a sword, you can say. It's a weapon. Yes, that's the word of God. How does Jesus use the word of God during the temptation, for instance? So let's get even more Aesop's fables in here. We have sheep amongst wolves, but we're to be like snakes and doves. So snakes. I got to tell you, I have a problem with the imagery of a snake, you know. As soon as we, we start talking about snakes, I think of the Garden of Eden. I think about the tempter. I, I think about the accuser. I think about all that the problem that came from that very first time in the garden. Be like a snake doesn't seem to make much sense to me. But John 3, right before the famous verse that we all know in John 3.16, says this. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Teaching Nicodemus there, Son of Man must be lifted up like that snake. Okay, so we'll leave that. We'll, we'll, we'll leave that saying that it's okay. We can get past that distraction. But it tells us to be shrewd. It tells us to be wise. Ephesians 5 says this, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think that speaks about sheep and wolves as well. The most common word for, uh, for wise in Greek is sophos, but that's not the word that's actually used here. Uh, there's a word, phonomos, which uh, is the idea of reining in or curbing something. That's the wisdom it's talking about. Not the normal word for wisdom. That same word is used in Matthew 24, uh, where it says this, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day that your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at which time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch, would not have left his house be broken into. So you must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise serpent? Uh, servant? I said serpent, see? Same idea here. Who's that faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. He'll be in put in charge of all of his possessions. This idea of meekness, as we're blessed in the Beatitudes, is limiting yourself. The world says, get as much as you can. Go for broke. How much money can you make in your lifetime? How far can you go in your career? 
How much can you learn? How much can you do? How large can you make your church? All these things. How big can you make it? All this thing. How big could your house be? All of these things. We want to go as big as we can. What if we said enough? Not because we didn't have the ability, but because we choose to limit. Because we have wisdom that pulls back that puts a rein on that, like, like a horse's rein, that has this, this limitation saying, that's not good, that's not godly, that's too far, that's going beyond what the Lord has for me here. Meekness is limiting yourself. The world says get as much as you can, hold on to everything you can. What if we were marked by setting limits on the houses that we buy, the cars that we drive, the roles that we take, the careers that we have? What if we intentionally said, enough? But we're fear-based. We believe that there isn't enough. We believe that there's not enough for, for you and, and me at the same time. It's got to be about me and mine. We think that in order to gain, somebody else has to lose. We already talked about Gideon a little bit, but what do we really know about Gideon? Besides the passage I read above, he was led into this meekness, not by his strength, not by the strength of his large army. The Lord took his army from 32,000 men that could do amazing things, down to 300. That was enough. That's enough. There's meekness there. Being shrewd in business might look like cheating on your taxes, arguing and haggling over agreements. The second part of this is not just that we're going to be as wise as serpents, but that we are innocent as a dove. I like the Young's literal here. It actually says, simple. Think of, of the, the combination of those terms. What, what does that have in common to be simple and to be innocent at the same time? Another translation gives us harmless as doves. Has anybody ever done unintentional harm to you? <laughs> have you been harmed by somebody, maybe intentionally? Church is called to be simple, to be harmless, to be innocent. And here we have a, another kind of word picture, not just like the horse being reined back, but the picture of the dove here is the Greek for being unmixed, of being pure. And if you look it up, I actually like it. It, it's, it says unmixed pure as in wines or metals. I don't know about you, but that's not necessarily what I think of when I think about things that are unmixed. But of the mind, it says without a mixture of evil, free from guile, innocence, and simple. It reminds me of an axiom that I, I say frequently. You know, the wisdom literature in the Bible is so, so important. Proverbs and, and Ecclesiastes and, and, and all these things that, that tell us, even, even Job, about how to live a, a rich life full of wisdom. And I heard this said, have you ever noticed how complicated somebody's life gets when they live without wisdom? Have you ever noticed how complicated their life gets when they live without wisdom? Because God's love, God's wisdom actually simplifies your life. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's not a, a particularly deep lesson, but how powerful, how beautiful. And you know how to do it. You could argue against it. You could want to have different things, but it's a simple lesson. Let's not mix it. God is love. God loves you. Oh, we love the complex because it makes us feel witty and wise with that complexity. Doves and serpents, simple and wise, but it's not one or the other. Think again of, of the, the snakes and dove chimera, like a sphinx. You know, you got the, the, the body of a lion, the head of a man, these combination things, because it's easy for us to go one way or the other. It's easy for us to hold on to one idea. But the Bible is so often a both and and not an either or. It calls us to, to hold on to these ideas at the same time. I have great idea that, that or great confidence that, that we could hold on to this idea of being innocent, Avoid bad people, avoid bad situations. You know, we want to stay pure. You know, and even if we're called to be wise, shrewd, and cunning like a serpent, you know what to do. Sharpen your wit and study up. You know, we, we want to make sure that we can do one of those things, and we could do one of those things really well. But Colossians 4 says it, I think, rather nicely. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. 
Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let's look at Christ. Because neither of those things in themselves speak to him. Was he innocent? Absolutely he was innocent. He was accused of terrible things. He was always mixing with those dirty, dirty sinners. <laughs> was he wise? Sure. But you couldn't get a straight answer out of the man. He was wise and he, he invited everybody to come alongside him. What are the notable characteristics when he was accused? When he was given up? When he was scourged? Be shrewd and innocent because we'll be turned over. From Luke, when Jesus was turned over, this is what we see. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together. Jesus was led before them. If you're the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. If I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you say that I am. <laughs> then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Whole assembly rose, led him off to Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove, like a sheep among wolves. When people are going towards trouble, when we offer them advice or counsel, when we need it ourselves, have we given or taken a Christ-like direction? Do we understand what wisdom and innocence actually look like, or do we have a worldly understanding of that? Do we sacrifice a dove so that we can be like a serpent? Is our understanding of innocence so simple that we have stricken wisdom from it? Do we value one over the other so that when we fail to find our way as Christ would lead us? A lot of questions. Let's pray. Lord, my greatest hope is that we struggle with these things, that we wrestle with these things, and that we're transformed by these things. We don't come for pat answers and, and easy ways out. We, we come to have a, an encounter with you. So I ask, Lord, that you would lead us today and tomorrow and for the rest of this week, that, that the scripture will come alive, that it'll speak to us, and that, Father, as we wrestle We'll hear you. We'll know you. That we'll be led by you. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Part of the, the challenge of, of this new preaching style that I want to be doing is I'm not exactly sure yet how we're going to incorporate ministry time with it. <laughs> You know, whenever I have a nice conclusion, it makes it for a very easy pat thing to respond to that. And we actually value ministry time a whole lot here. Um, so what I want us to do now instead, as, as, we're, as I'm figuring this thing out, and thank you for being patient with me as I figure out this new, new style. Could we come up and have some worship? And let's just take some Holy Spirit moments. Let's see what the Holy Spirit will bring up. Let's see what he convicts us of. Let's see what he leads us to do. And, and if you feel convicted of something, if you feel that you need to, to repent, if you feel like you need to respond in any way, um, we would love to meet with you. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to, to bless that. If there's a scripture that comes to your mind, if there's something that you, you just know that the Lord is saying, we want to share those things with each other, share those encouragements. Yeah. Can I share something? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Lord put it on my heart in the past week or so, um, to, if anyone wants to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you've never done that, and obviously we leave. Jessica, I believe she was singing extemporaneously, um, you know, making up a new song to the Lord, inviting the Holy Spirit. And um, of course, He's here. It was it was just so beautiful. And um, anyway, it kind of goes along with just saying, "Lord, fill me with Your Spirit for Your purposes." Uh, like.
like Leah was sharing. So um, if you want prayer to be filled with the Holy Spirit, um, I guess come up there or something. Absolutely. Yeah, look. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So the, the, the call, if you didn't hear it, was, was to, if you never or if you need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit, we care a lot about this. This is, this is part of the fun stuff about, about being a church. We just want to bless you over here. It can be scary, and I get that. It can be exciting, and I get that. Um, but it's so important. It's so vital for us. God bless you all. Thank you for coming by. Um, thank you for the stream. We're going to cut the stream at this point, um, but it's not too late. I, I do believe what, what Bev said is applicable to us, you know, and um, perhaps you don't feel like you're without. Well, let's see what the Holy Spirit's got for us anyway. <laughs> let's knock on that door. Let, let's see what, what his blessing looks like. Let's see what the fullness that he has for us. You got something?
Yeah. We just want to have a prayer for those at home uh, who desire more of the Holy Spirit for God's purposes. Um, so, Lord, I ask that you meet those who are in their living rooms or their bedrooms, and I thank you for your presence, and I thank you, Lord, that, that um, your spirit is there, and, and I ask, Father, that you meet them and reveal your heart, more of your heart and more of your purposes, Father, and, and, and to just uh, manifest yourself to them, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, for your glory and your purposes, Lord, and just speak to them this week. So we say, come, Holy Spirit, in your, in your great power and mercy. Amen.